Hi again and welcome to part two of my contemplative spread mini-series on uh, Sephiroth and how you can use it as a tarot spread. <clears throat> okay, so in the previous video we talked about all the philosophical ends of uh, the spread, or rather the Tree of Life, um, and that was sort of complicated. So we'll basically rehash those principles when we use it in practice. So I've already shuffled, and I'm using my little uh, Crowley Taught deck, because um, <laughs> which has the devil on the bottom, <laughs> um, because my big one would not fit right here. Uh, not that that's relevant to you, but uh, OK. So I'm going to start. Um, though remember that the devil is uh, as a bottom card is important for the reading that we're going to do. I just asked for an example reading. Um, hopefully this uh, does not talk about me because uh, <laughs> for the past few uh, videos I've done it's been talking about my personal situation and I um, don't want to bore you guys with that again. Um, okay, so sorry, just trying to create some room. Okay, so we're going to start at the top and work our way down. Okay, remember I'm mirroring this for you guys. Um, and so we're going to start at number one, which makes sense, right? Keter. Okay, so for Keter we have the Lust card seen here. So uh, Keter, again, is the purest uh, aspect of the individual at the moment. Um, basically, it's what their, it's the will of their highest self, absolutely highest self. Um, Basically, it is the source, excuse me, the unmanifested, uh, what's the word I want? The uh, unmanifested guiding force through their situation at the moment. Um, and it's so concealed that the person maybe doesn't even realize that this is what is underneath it all. Um, so this is very important. Okay. Uh, but of course, being Keter, it's sort of undefined, so there's not much we can really say about that. We might be able to say that the person is uh, feeling very passionate about several things right now, um, but we're not really sure what that is, what the goal of that is. So to understand that, we're going to need to draw for the rest of the supernal triangle, which is Chokhmah and Binah here. So for the father, or Chokhmah, we have the Three of Wands, so now we see that the primary uh, goal, or rather the um, the force, the direction that this is taking, is in uh, basically self-activation. The individual is trying to um, follow a better path for themselves. Maybe they're trying to uh, do things right as they feel it, um, trying to rectify their behavior or something like that and do things that are a little more exciting for them. In Binah, the form that that is meant to take, we have the priestess. So we see that the form is meant to take um, an intuitive side uh, that basically the individual needs to get uh, in touch with their, uh, their subconscious, their intuitive aspects, their higher self, their guides, their helpers, what, I mean, again, whatever you want to call it, but they need to feel more in tune with their intuition and what they, what they really know to be true. Okay, um, so viewing just the supernal triangle, remember that these two cards are co-equal, technically. Um, I mean, uh, basically misogynist Kabbal Kabbalists or traditional Kabbalists would say that the father is superior to the mother because it comes first, but really, um, they are entirely co-equal. They are meant to be co-equal. Okay? Um, right. And they are, in, in and of themselves, contained in this. So we see this card being a fusion, basically, of these two. Okay? So that's something you can think about as you contemplate with this spread. You're going to want to think about the different relationships between cards and ideas and see how they blend together or dissolve, okay, separate. So now from there we've got one, two, three, now we're going to do number four which is Chesed, or Jupiter basically. Remember this is the zodiac <laughs> and this is Saturn. This has no planet. 
For the number four, we have the queen of discs. So this is how, uh, remember, chesed means mercy. So I would say that this is how the individual is acting um, to their highest good, to the to the, the betterment of people around them, um, how they are connecting with their friends and neighbors, um, and whether or not that is active in their lives. And as the Queen of Discs is here, we might say that the individual is um, being very kind to people around them, that they are very generous with themselves, with their resources and their time, um, that they're very nurturing to people around them, that they care for, you know, things like nature, that sort of thing. Um, and that that is an expression of their, um, some of their highest aspirations, basically, or some of their highest understandings of God, that the way that they um, conceptualize God's mercy is through his creation and his nurturing aspect. Okay. And perhaps the person is trying to embody that themselves. And again, remember we have the abyss basically separating this, the supernal triangle from everything below it. But essentially, Chokhmah directly begets Chesed, because they are both on the pillar of mercy. Okay, And the same thing applies for Gabora directly below Binah. They are both in the same pillar. Okay, So they share similar principles, though from different influences. Um, and Gaborah is power or uh, vengeance, remember, justice. And uh, here we have the Four of Cups. Okay, so this is how the individual is expressing their activity. Basically, it's how they are, see they are expressing their energy um, as a divine being, basically. Um, so, uh, we might say that this person leads a kind of boring life, <laughs> that they don't really use their energy particularly well, um, that things are good in their life, but uh, things move very slowly for them. There's a heaviness to their amount of energy. They might feel tired a lot. They might not have a whole lot of motivation to do things. They sort of put things off, um, that sort of thing. Okay, um, So that's in Gabor, their energy center. Or alternatively, you know, if we look at it from an esoteric point of view, again, Chesed being God's uh, power, we might say that the person views God's power as uh, sort of dull, maybe. Um, that they don't think God moves particularly quickly, or um, God has basically ceased to be a force in their lives, or whatever force he is, is, is for them, it's kind of minimal and... Uh, <clears throat> not particularly active, okay? But again, these are things that you're going to want to contemplate as you save this spread in your memory bank. Um, next is Tifidet, the six. And remember, this is the harmonious integration of all these forces and is uh, akin to the sun. So it is uh, the, uh, the manifested aspect of this, or the highest manifested aspect of Keter, of all these other forces, okay, and how they blend and create something quite lovely and truthful. It's very pure like Keter. And we have the Three of Swords. Now, uh, this Tifidet is also the ego center of the individual. So this is someone who also uh, has experienced great pain in their lives. Um, and we would say that this is the center, literally the center of their being. Their universe is hubbed around the Three of Swords, literally, because it is the sun of their respective solar system, their subjective solar system. And so um, it's funny that these two principles should find harmony in this, and whether or not you would find that harmonious or not is kind of up to you. Um, again, this is an example reading, and I'm not going to try to spend time thinking about why that is, but we would we would say that uh, the center of this person's universe is the Three of Swords, which is very sad, obviously, um, and very bleak. Um, they probably are depressed a lot. They might be very stressed often because it's a sword, um, a sword card. Um, they might get upset very easily over things, okay? Um, that sort of direction. So now from there we draw for the number seven, which is Netzach. 
And Netzach, again, means victory and is associated with the emotions or how the uh, individual is expressing joy in their lives. And for this, we have the Four of Swords. Now, note that the Four of Swords is very similar to the Four of Cups here. Okay, These two are, I can tell you right now, are very related. Um, in in their quality, you know, being the two fours that we've drawn so far is very interesting. We've also drawn two threes, okay, um, which is, may or may not be significant. Again, things to think about. But um, having uh, the four of swords in the place of their emotions, or in how they are expressing bliss or happiness in their lives, uh, they aren't. Uh, basically, it's sort of a standstill. Uh, again, it's a very similar vibe to this. Um, this almost feels like uh, indifference of action, whereas this almost feels like indifference of happiness. It's it's a it's a weird thing because, and I think that goes back to this because this is such a strong influence of their lives. Um, it's very hard for them to experience real happiness uh, or to create happiness for themselves it's always kind of like a standstill um, and uh, their sense of happiness is continually on hold basically now opposite that is the number eight for hold or mercury and hold is the intelligence uh, of the individual how their intelligence their abstract thought is giving shape to their situation and we have hit three swords in a row now so this is getting really um, agitated and it's the eight of swords now being eight within the eighth sephira means this is very strong this is going to be a very uh, major influence in um, for the person at the moment it tells us that they are functioning particularly from a logical level and not an emotional level their emotions are on standby and their brain is running eight miles a minute um, which is a lot of miles per minute to be running okay <laughs> if you are on foot okay that's what I meant uh, <laughs> but anyway they, they, they think so much that there really isn't any uh, freedom for them they, uh, there are so many things on this person's plate that they're thinking about all at once, and it feels very claustrophobic to them. And maybe this is why, um, this is how this is expressing itself logically. Um, it's just, it's, it's feeling very bleak. Things feel very heavy, um, and locked down. Now for Yesod, Yesod is the, uh, the basic subconscious, like the first layer of subconscious, the automatic aspect of ourselves, and basically how all this stuff finds integration, and uh, is also this, one of the major sources of flux in our lives. And we have the Ace of Swords. So this is good, because we finally get a reset button from these three sword cards that were not particularly positive for this person. And we see that in Yesod, um, basically their intuition is nudging at themselves that these are not good, that there are higher things that need to be worked on and adjusted, and that basically they are they're coming into a greater sense of understanding of their situation and they're, clar and, and they're becoming a lot more clear with themselves uh, and they're developing a lot more focus. The fact that it's an ace on the middle pillar, uh, rem remember that Keter is on the middle pillar too and is associated with the aces, this is fairly strong too. So the, the person is experiencing a kind of wake-up call, basically, I would say, um, from a, 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 a part of themselves that they're not used to really hearing from. Remember that the goal of their uh, current situation, the shape that it was going to take, was the priestess, which represented communication with the subconscious, with the intuition. And we can see how that is a major aspect of where this needs to go. Um, as well as great passion and intensity, which is totally lacking from this person's life. It's saying that this person needs to devote themselves much more to these things, um, to these communications, um, basically, because they're not allowing that. They don't really see much of a point in it, and they see it, pot potentially logically, they see it as clutter. And so maybe now, finally, an, a, a more... Uh, basic aspect of their intuition is sort of yelling at them and saying, hey, there is potential in that that you have not necessarily realized yet. 
um, and it could help you and improve your situation. And now lastly, the, the final card for Malkut, or the kingdom, the physical, actual uh, aspect of the reading, sorry, my cards get all messed up, uh, is the Magus. Okay, so the Magus represents the physical aspect of the situation, how the situation is actually playing out it, for themselves personally and the world around them, how they are directly influencing simply by existing things around them. And so the Magus is, is very interesting. Notice that most of this person's conscious, consciousness is uh, defined by air. <laughs> Um, this person has very, uh, very little other influence. They have no. Uh, they have one earthy aspect here that could certainly be developed, and their water is sort of blasé. Okay, but most of their focuses are on air and logical principles. So we see that this person is a very talented individual, someone who can uh, get a lot done. They're good at micromanaging all these things. They, they like to feel in power of all those things. Um, they feel that they're good at that, and they like that sense of power. But, as always, the Magus is sort of tricky. He is also a lord of illusion, and... Um, you know, we can safely say that there's an elusive quality to this card, I-L-L, -L, not E-L, elusive quality to this card, because there is so much up here that demonstrates the person's uh, difficulties at the moment, um, that underneath that sort of sheen is someone who's been very, very hurt, um, and is still harboring that hurt. So, this has become, in many ways, a bandage, uh, and, a, and a kind of mediocre bandage, too. In some ways, the person is lying to themselves by keeping their, uh, their, self, the, their consciousness locked up, basically. They've uh, sort of put it all in a box and locked it and hid it under the bed. And, you know, perhaps this is telling them that they, they need to do something about it. Um, or perhaps it is showing that um, they feel they need a solution and the way they're actually taking the solution is not necessarily good for them. Um, or it's not long-lasting. Um, and remember, the sword suit is very much, I mean rather, the three of swords is very much connected to the ace of swords. The three of swords in some ways begets the lunar ace of swords. And so, uh, in some ways, we could say that the Ace of Swords being the most fluid aspect, I would say, of this whole reading, um, being in Yesod, it's kind of like the person is fluctuating between, I guess, feelings of clarity and understanding of their situation, um, and sadness and sorrow, but that the sorrow is always there. You know, this is always constant. This is what fluctuates and directly because of all these above influences. So this, uh, this basically is the final emanation of everything, and this is what needs to be uh, evaluated a lot. Um, well, there are lots of things that need to be evaluated for this imaginary person. Um, you know, so it's, there's, there's a lot of potential up here at the top of the reading with the supernal triangle. We can see that the individual is um, experiencing something very important in their lives that um, you know could give them a jump start and really reawaken them to something much more exciting uh, and uh, something that they can get much more impassioned about. Um, but it really won't be until they release this block that they can really experience that. Um, and in some ways this has manifested itself as this. It's almost as if when this person when this person has attempted to act on this in their lives, they have shut down and um, produced all these unhealthy ways of seeing the world, basically, or here, you know. Um, so again, there is hope for this person. Um, there is great hope for this person, especially if they take whatever power they've gained here and 
uh, invert it, basically, okay, and turn it inwards. Okay, so I hope that that was uh, fairly understandable, <laughs> um, or at least uh, interesting. Um, I realize it, uh, it, was, it, it is a little complicated, but once you get the hang of it, uh, I swear it's it's something that is um, that's very natural. It makes a lot of sense. Um, the Tree of Life in general is something that I highly recommend you think about and meditate on uh, over a, a lifetime. Basically, uh, it it helps uh, organize one's contemplation. I think uh, again, getting back to the idea that it's kind of a living file cabinet, uh, and it's a, it's a wonderful way of trying to get at the heart of one's situation. Um, remember the Tetragrammaton spread I did? That is very similar because Tetragrammaton can be placed on the Tree of Life and is basically the abridged version of the tree. Um, but this gives you all the sub-details which can be very helpful and really tackles uh, every aspect of your life even if you uh, think it's kind of not doing that uh, in the sense that you know it's only talking about certain things but really all those things play out in large scales throughout your life. Um, and remember that Keter is always going to be your main idea for the entire reading. That's the basis. It is present in some form or another in all of those other cards. Um, okay, I, I hope this was useful and that you enjoyed it and that you didn't find it too, uh, too confusing. Please, if you have any questions about it, uh, or feedback, please let me know. And uh, thank you very much for watching and staying with me and subscribing and all that. So, uh, and of course, as always, if there are any suggestions for videos, uh, please let me know. I'm happy to try to do them for you. All right, thank you very much, and take care. Enjoy the weekend. Bye.